Hello, hello, good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us for Spring Fever, uh, short plays and stories brought to you this evening by the fantastic folks at Darien Arts Center and JIB Production. Uh, before we get started, just a quick thank you also, as always, to the Friends of Darien Library who support, among other things, our Zoom licensing, uh, which has been instrumental this past year or so uh, during our virtual programming. Um, and very quickly, before I introduce um, Amy Allen from the Darien Arts Center, just a quick note to our virtual attendees this evening. Uh, this is a Zoom webinar. So that means that you can see and hear the speakers and the performers this evening, but they cannot see or hear you. So no worries about that. Um, if you have a comment tonight, you can put that in the chat box at any time. Um, also, if you experience any technical issues, you can go ahead and let us know in the chat um, and our tech assistant will try to troubleshoot with you. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the Executive Director of Darien Arts Center, Amy Allen. Amy, welcome and thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you very much, Kira. The Darien Arts Center is delighted to be partnering with the Darien Library and Jib Productions tonight. All of us here at the Darien Arts Center are truly grateful for the support we received from the community this year as we've had tremendous success with keeping our doors open and our on-site and virtual programming well attended despite all of the COVID restrictions. We invite you to join us again here at the Darren Art Center on April 10th and April 11th to see East Coast Contemporary Ballet, a professional dance company perform in the DAC Weatherstone studio. Visit our website, darianarts.org, for more information about our on ongoing dance, visual arts, and music classes and summer camp program. Next, I'd like to thank Karen Alfini, Senior Tech Assistant at the Darian Library for coordinating tonight's web Zoominar, Zoom webinar. And a special thank you to Carol Schweig and Diana Mueller at Jib Productions, and of course, all of tonight's actors. And now it's time to introduce our MC for the night, Carol Schweig. Take it away, Carol. Okay, uh, thank you, Amy. Um, my name is Carol Schweig and I am the artistic director of JIB Productions. We are primarily known for our lunchtime theater series, Play With Your Food, which takes place all over Fairfield County. And I am very excited to tell you that we will be introducing our first outside season later this spring. So we hope that you'll find us online and that you will come and join us for a live performance. The website will be in the chat section a bit later. All right, so for tonight, we are thrilled to be celebrating the end of a very, very long winter with you. And for those of us who are new to play with your food, um, you will see from tonight's selections that we love bringing you really good writing. And since it was just St. Patrick's Day, there's no one who can get as Irish on more than James Joyce. And just for fun, we'll throw in a little baseball into the mix. And after the plays, um, stick around and we'll come back with all the actors and have ourselves a little talk back about the plays, about different topics, whatever you want us to talk about. So first up, we have a special tribute to the Darien Library, who is hosting us tonight. And this play is dedicated to librarians everywhere. The play is called Kick-Ass Librarian, and it's written by Jason Wilkins. Enjoy. Front desk, how may I help you? The library is open Monday through Friday from 10 to 5. You're welcome. Front desk, how may I help you? Yes, the capital of Nevada is Carson City. You're welcome. Uh, excuse me, ma'am? Miss. Sorry? According to Emily Post, it is most proper for a young man to address a young woman as Miss, not Ma'am, since the latter form of address has an unflattering whiff of spinsterhood about it. May I help you? Uh, I, I was wondering if you could just turn off the internet filter on computer station number three. Alrighty. 
Done. I'm not going to look at porn or anything. All righty. Front desk, how may I help you? Yes. Well, quantum mechanics are compatible with classical mechanics in physical situations where classical mechanics agree with experiment. You're welcome. I need to return this. I, I think it's a little late. All righty. Actually, this book is very late. Sorry. Six weeks late. Uh, what do I owe? That's actually a good question. As it happens, there is a waiting list for this book. There are 14 names on it. One might say that you owe all 14 of those people an apology. <laughs> well, I mean. But then again, maybe they all owe you a word of thanks. After all, you have thus far saved them from the brain rotting literary Ebola that is the Da Vinci Code. Really? Oh, I heard it was good. I, I never actually got around to reading it myself, but I- Ah, uh, so apparently you see the public library, our temple of shared learning, the repository of thousands of years of intellectual inquiry, the last truly democratic institution in America as a source of paperweights. Can I just please pay the fines here? Is this a coffee stain? Have you no sense of decency? Lighten up, it's only a book. Only a book? Get out of here before I kick your ass. What? Even this mass market piece of crap has more of a spine than you do. Next time you need an airplane book, go to borders like the rest of the sheep. <sighs> wow, you sure do take your work seriously. Yes, we librarians are a dedicated lot. Ours is a high calling. Really? Oh, yes. If knowledge is power, then I'm in charge of an arsenal. Never thought of it that way. See, you just learned something new. Doesn't it feel good? You know, every time you learn something new, the very structure of your brain is changed. Little sparks fly across the gaps between cells, and your skull is alive with electric fire. Your brain expands, grows more sensitive, more powerful, more sexy. Sexy? Oh, yes. All sensations register in the brain, so sex really is in the head, and the bigger the brain. Ooh. I'm sorry. <laughs> I got off track there for a moment. May I help you with something? What? Oh, uh, no thanks. I'm not looking at porn. All righty. Why not? <clears throat> Please excuse me. Front desk, how may I help you? Yes, actually the lyrics to Louie Louie are not at all obscene. Although, if you listen carefully to the original recording, you can hear the drummer click his sticks together and shout the F word. Yes, really. You're welcome, Timmy. Are you the head librarian? Yes, how may I help you? Well, I'm Special Agent Ringworm with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I'm here to inspect some of your records. I see. Well, government documents are stored in the stacks on the basement level. Uh, that's not what I mean, ma'am. Miss. Well, I have to call you ma'am, ma'am, regulations. I'm here to look at your- uh... One moment, please. You were saying Special Agent Ringworm? Uh, I, I was saying, ma'am, that I'm here to look at your circulation records. Oh, why? Do you think you might have a book overdue? Uh, ma'am, we at the FBI would like to know if any of your patrons are checking out materials of a suspicious nature. Books on chemistry, Arabic language manuals, Michael Moore DVDs, stuff like that. I see. And I assume you claim the authority to invade the privacy of my patrons under the provisions of the Patriot Act? Yes, ma'am. Uh, that's right. I see. Well, I'm afraid I can't help you with that, Special Agent Ringworm. I seem to have just deleted all of the circulation records from our system. What? You what? Silly me. I'll never get the hang of this darn computer. Oh, I could arrest you, ma'am. For what? Refusing to give you something I don't have? Okay. How about this? You tell me if anyone in this library right now has asked you to turn off the internet filter. Why do you want to know that? Well, this is a matter of national security, ma'am, and I don't have time for questions from some uppity small town librarian. Just 
tell me what I want to know, and I won't have to read you your rights. I know my rights, Special Agent Ringworm, better than you do, I dare say. Incidentally, have you ever heard of the Song of the Cobra? What's that, a metal band? No, it is a technique perfected by a sect of Buddhist monks in the highest reaches of the Himalayas. They found that if they achieved wisdom, mastered the ways of the orderly mind, and spoke in a gentle, melodic manner reminiscent of the mountain flute, they could easily overpower the weak-minded. The weak-minded. Yes. Everyone who attempted to drive the monks out of their monastery was eventually found in a puddle of their own drool at the foot of the mountain, babbling like an idiot. Like an idiot. Yes. Don't you find that fascinating, you crypto-fascist right-wing stormtrooper? Me, crypto-fascist right-wing stormtrooper. Yes, very good. Now, why don't you head up to the children's reading room on the second floor? They have free copies of the Bill of Rights for you to read. Bill of Rights, for me to read. Bill of Rights. That was so cool what you just did. Thanks for covering for me. Oh, well, it's nothing. I do the same for any patron. That's the fourth FBI agent we've seen this year. Cool. Uh, May I help you find something? Well, actually, I'm looking for a date. Oh, uh, a date in American history or? Oh, no, 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 not that kind of date. I mean. Oh. I see. Yeah. I mean, that's why I had you turn off the filter so I could go to the, the matchmaker sites and search the area for single women. Ah, oh, well, how's the search going? Uh, that is, um, what search criteria have you been using? Uh, so far, I've searched by age, zip code, level of education, height, smoker, non-smoker, eye color, last good book read. Why? That's a very thorough search, but no luck. Would you like to go out with me? Before I answer, I must tell you something that might cause you to think I'm strange. What is it? I have tattoos. You do? Where? Everywhere. My entire body is an illuminated manuscript. It took me years of patience and pain to achieve it. On this breast, I have a little drawing of a nightingale in a tree and a passage from Keats. On this breast, stars whirl in the night sky and on my abdomen, well. Oh, I, I can only imagine. And on my back, there's a detailed map of the Library of Congress. The Library of Congress? Oh, it's magnificent. Have you seen it? No, but I hope to get the chance someday. So. You don't think I'm too strange? I think you're magnificent. The library is open until five. Be here at 4.59, but make sure to take all materials for checkout to the front desk by 4.50. Yes, ma'am. Miss. <laughs> front desk, how may I help you? Yes, actually, that's Byron. And the verse goes, she walks in, beauty, like the night of cloudless climes and starry skies. Yes, I'm sure. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed that. I certainly did. Um, for our next piece, next up, we are going back to the 1700s and to a time when traveling actors or players roamed the countryside entertaining the local folk. Here is Oliver Goldsmith's theatrical tale on the fleetingness of fame and good fortune. We give you Adventures of a Strolling Player. I went some days ago to take a walk in St. James Park. I sat down on one of the benches, at the other end of which was seated a man in 
very shabby clothes, but I could perceive in his figure somewhat of the gentleman, but gentility shorn of its beams. I beg pardon, spoke I. Uh, your face is familiar to me. I, I think I've seen you before. Oh, yes, sir, replied he. I was for a time an actor known in every town in England. I have been for some years now a musician to a puppet show. However, the master and I quarreled and parted. He to sell his puppets to a pincushion maker, and I to starve in St. James Park. And though I cannot boast of eating much, there are few that are merrier. What think you, sir, of a steak and tankard? Perhaps you shall treat me now, and I will treat you when I find you in the park in love with eating and without the money to pay for a dinner. As I never refuse a small expense for the sake of a merry companion, we instantly adjourned to a neighboring alehouse, and in a few moments a frothing tankard and a smoking steak was spread on the table before us. The fellow's vivacity, joined with his poverty, raised my curiosity to know something of his life and circumstances, and I entreated him if he would indulge my wish. Oh, that I will, sir. I am very well descended. My ancestors have made some noise in the world. My mother cried oysters, and my father was a drummer. He tried to breed me up to his own employment, but since I have no ear for music, I simply ran away. Well, after traveling some days, whom should I light upon but a company of strolling players? The moment I saw them, my heart warmed to them. We soon became so well acquainted that they took me in, at first as their servant. Oh, this was paradise to me. They sang, they danced, they drank, they ate, and they traveled all at the same time. They liked me as much as I liked them, for I was a very good figure, as you see, and though I was poor, I was not modest. Soon after, we arrived at the town of Tenterton, where we were to perform Romeo and Juliet. Romeo was to be played by a gentleman from the Drury Lane, Juliet by a woman who had never appeared on any stage before, and I was to snuff the candles. We were all excellent in our way. You see, there is one rule by which a strolling player may be ever secure of success. That is, to make a great deal of the character, to cry, ring, cringe into attitudes, mark the emphasis, slap the pockets, and labor like one in the falling sickness. That is the way to work for applause. And that is the way to gain it. <laughs> Well, our performance gave universal satisfaction. The audiences were enchanted with our powers, and Tenterton is a town of taste. It was but natural for me to ascribe part of the success to myself. I snuffed the candles, and let me tell you, without a candle snuffer, the piece would lose half its charm. Well, we continued for a fortnight, and even doubled our prices, when behold, one of the principal actors fell ill of a violent fever. This was a stroke like thunder to our little company. So I seized the moment and offered to act the part myself in his stead. I learned my part with astonishing rapidity and bid adieu to snuffing candles ever after. Let the sick man be under no unease to get well. He may even die if he thinks it proper. I'll fill his place to universal satisfaction. He shall never be missed. <laughs> Nature seemed to have fitted me for the part. I was tall and had a loud voice. My very entrance excited universal applause. Since it was a very passionate part, I invigorated my spirits with three full glasses of brandy. I had attitudes in abundance, came off a prodigy. And such was my success. Oh, upon my word, cried the town squire's wife. He will make one of the finest actors in Europe. I say it, and I think I am something of a judge. <laughs> oh, I sincerely believe I could have been, or should have been, one of the finest actors in Europe. 
But unfortunately, there was here in town a lady who had received an education of nine months in London. This gave her pretensions to taste wherever she went. She refused at first to see me perform, but was at last prevailed upon. And it was intimated to me that a difficult judge was to be present at my next exhibition. In no way intimidated, I came onto the stage commanding as usual. But I began to notice that the whole audience had their eyes turned upon the lady who had been nine months in London. Try as I might to excite a little smile, the lady yawned and shrugged and sighed. My good humor became forced. My laughter converted to a hysteric grinning and my eyes showed the agony of my heart. My fame expired. My growing merit came to an untimely frost, nipped me in the bud, and here I am, an actor no more. I, I commend you for your kindness, and I thank you for the meal, and I shall be on my way. And with a tip of his hat, he was gone. I set off to home to contemplate the fleetingness of good fortune and of fame. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, there are two words that one almost never hears together, and they are Shakespeare and baseball. But the comedians, Wayne and Schuster, created a baseball game for the ages. And now that baseball season is upon us, we would like to bring you the Shakespearean baseball game. Enjoy. Hail, Gratanio. I give you greeting, Antonio. How go with you this day? This day, ah, such a day. I think in all my life, I've rarely seen a place as lively fill with such a crowd of local scholars, friends and foes and fans. It's lovely how they filled in all the stands. Two ball clubs, both alike in dignity, in fairest Connecticut where we lay our scene, the story of which will now become the next 10 minutes traffic upon this glorious stage. After all, all the world's a stage and they are merely players. Hast thou the starting lineup? Aye, the batting orders duly signed by managers both. Hark, the players come to our appointed places. Shall we go? You at first and I behind the plate. This game depends on how you make your call. Farewell until you hear me cry, play ball. My excellent good friends, may fortune smile upon our enterprise this day. As manager on um, this most valiant club, I swear by all that's holy in our game, I shall not rest until the pennant over Stratford flies. Uh, most noble manager. Who calls? Uh, Tis I, sir. Well, speak, oh, faithful player. I pray you, tell us, how does the starting lineup go? Oh, tis as was before with Harry, Joe, and Pete out in the field. And uh, these three guarding their custom bags, Sam the first, Bill the second, and Richard the third. And as for you, most noble player. Sire. Hide to the bullpen so that if our pitcher from his box is knocked, you shall go upon the mound and take his place. Well, some players are born great. Some achieve greatness and some have greatness thrust upon them. I go. Ah. Uh. For this relief, much thanks. Speak, O oh faithful Rusty. Where is the captain of our team? The mighty Rocky, the man whom all the sports re reporters call the noblest catcher of them all. Alas, the mighty Rocky sits in yonder locker room and mopes. And well he might, for in these last ten games he has not hit the ball not even once. Yes, hitless has he gone and 20 times has been called out on strikes. Oh, but soft he comes. To think he led the league in RBIs, and now he reads the record books and cries. Oh, what a rogue and bush league slob am I. 
Is it not monstrous that this player here, but in a fiction, in a dream of passion, should gaze upon the record book and find that he is ten games hitless gone? Oh, cursed fate, that I who led the league should bat but 208. A hit, a hit, my kingdom for a hit. Once more to hear the welcome crack of bat upon the ball, and then to run to first, to second, and then for third, and then to slide for home, to slide, slide, slide. Aye, there's the rub. There's a divinity who shapes her end. Play ball! Game begins! Pitchers, catchers, shortstops, lend me your ears. The game begins, and we must win. And win we shall. The manager's blessing upon you all, and for your captain, Noble Rocky, give me your hand. Gladly given. Play well, valiant captain. And remember, today's game is being televised. Televised. And the TV shall record each passing play. TV or not TV, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to record the slings and arrows of outrageous baseball or to share it only with the crowd at hand. Nonetheless, we shall play with might and- Time passes. How goes the game? Not well. It is bottom of the ninth with one away and they do lead us by a score of one to nothing. Who's next to bat? Tis I, Macduff. Ready am I to do thy bidding, sire. If it be now, tis not to come. If it be not to come, it will be now. If it be not now yet, it will come. The readiness is all. Take thee thy bat and hie thee to the plate. I go. How goes it, cousin? Chances dim with every pitch, tis one away. Macduff is at the plate. Lay on, Macduff, and watch out for that breaking stuff. <laughs> A very palpable hit! Foul ball! Foul ball! He called that a foul a plague upon him. That ball was fair. That ball fair was, was foul. indeed. You sir, that ball was fair. That ball was foul. So fair a foul I have not seen. Ancient knave with heart as black as coat you wear upon your back. Get thee a pair of glasses. Get thee to an optometrist. You run a snag grandma, sir. I, uh, would the gods had made me more poetical? Now is the summer of our discontent. Tis two away, just one chin, one more chance. To do, we have to win the game. Who's next? Tis I. Tis you? There it is. Then go, my friend, and with aid divine, and hit that Pepsi Cola sign! See how the valiant Rocky stands at the plate? Like a mighty colossus, the bat resting gently off his shoulder. With soft. Here's the wind-up. Here's the pitch. Oh! Oh no, I cannot look the sight that sear my eyes. The ball did strike his head. The pitcher beaned him. He comes this way. Oh, I cannot look. Oh, what a noble mind is overthrown. Two outs, they have a spot. Life is but a walking shadow. A poor player who hits and bunts this weary hour upon the field and then is heard no more. It is a tale told by an umpire full of sound and fury, signifying one nothing. Now cracks a noble head. Good night, sweet catcher. Flights of shortstop sing thee to thy rest. 
Let four bonus players bear a rocky like a soldier to the dugout. No more shall Darien see him play ball. I'm trading the bum to Montreal. Thank you, gentlemen. We certainly hope you enjoyed that. Um, you know, this piece was... Uh, just a sec, let me get my little notes up here. Here we go. This piece was created for television by um, way back in the 1950s. And um, Wayne and Schuster kind of created things very much like on the same feeling as Saturday Night Live. So this was... Um... Now, before I introduce our last play, just let me take you take a minute to remind you that after the play, we're going to invite the actors to come back and we'll have a little talk back afterwards. So you can send topics in your chat or questions. And I think we'll have some fun talking about all different aspects of what you've seen tonight. Now, for our final piece. Where did it go? What? Well, here time of the year that we honor all things Irish. And who better than James Joyce? In this short play, Ireland's greatest writer meets up with his favorite character. The name of the play is Molly and James, and it's written by Sheila Walsh. Enjoy. Bye bye. Uh, being wed to a man is like living a half baked life, if you ask me. Oh, look at the lines. Ah, oh, now come, Molly, not nearly as bad as most. You've been blessed with the looks. Fine lot he notices. Might as well be married to a blind man. I wonder what that would be like. Keen sense of touch, I'll bet. <laughs> oh, not my fault, I was given more than most. Wonder what pack of lies I'll be telling this face 10 years on. Go on, girl, you're not nearly as shriveled as the rest of them. Who's there? Who's there? I'll write you, weasel. Come out from behind there. I can explain. Oh, and you will, to the bobbies. I am no robber, I assure you. Here, take the bottle. We don't want it broken. Oh, come out. And I have a strong arm, can easily defend itself. You know, you have every right to be angry with me. Thank you, sir. A dumb as I am, I need you to tell me how I feel. Now out with you before I blew your arse like your mother forgot to do to you. You're exactly as I knew you'd be. None of your lip, laddie. Move on. You're absolutely right. Keep the bottle. How foolish of me to think I could slip into your room and actually be welcomed. Huh. Sounds ridiculous even to me. <laughs> Look, my truth is, I was driven to know you. Are you one of the nuts from the asylum? Oh, Molly. First name basis, rude on top of your other thoughts? Mrs. Bloom, my name is James. James Joyce. I'm a writer. So? Of course, so. <laughs> Do you think uh, a drink, it would help me to explain? I'm not interested. The door is to the right. I need you. And don't slam it. I'll stop time for you. I'll chisel you into a clay of words. As you are now, Mrs. Bloom. I'll make you for an eternity. I want to write about you. What do you mean you want to use me? Uh, I am suggesting I want to profit from you. What else? You know, I have artistic talents too. Uh, not with words on the page, but I've been known to hit many a good note. Oh, 
Well, would you sing for me? <laughs> Go on with yourselves. I'm no nightingale for strangers. Schlante. Schlante. <clears throat> Once I got a hundred roses, wild, picked from the woods from a boy of 19. He heard me sing. He watched me sing. He gave me roses. Oh, what a pleasure knowing one brings pleasure. I'd be honored if you'd sing. <laughs> you think because we shared this drink, I'll forgiven? You've still to tell the nature of your visit. I mean, grand whiskey we're drinking, though. Well, I'm pleased that you're enjoying it. See, I have an idea for a book, Mrs. Bloom. Oh, Molly, for heaven's sakes, makes me feel like a crone with that missus. Thank you, Molly. You're an odd combination. Courage to come to my room and the other side filled with apologies. Odd combination indeed. Go on about the book. Oh yes, my book. How do I explain? Uh, you open your mouth and say your truth. I know, Dumbbell. You can talk to me like, uh, like you talk to your mates. I'm listening, James. I want to write about a woman like you. Like me? I me? There are no like me's. Oh, so right. I stand corrected. I want to write about you. For what purpose need you come to my bedroom? Well, for the purpose of accuracy. You see, until I saw you, you were just in my imagination. Then, as if out of nowhere, you appeared. Walks, struts, oh, swirls. This woman of warmth, red hair, first impression. She walks in freedom of her body. You got me there. Go on now. What was I wearing? You got that? Oh. Dress of sky blue, speckled with dots. Oh, doesn't she know? Petticoat swooning beneath the swaying blue skirt. All she knows. Shawl of gray slipping slightly off the shoulder. Don't you see something like I've got swan white skin? I think that sounds really. Oh, shh. Her face, pink, brightness shining. Oh, sea colored eyes lead to chiseled cheeks. Oh, that's nice. What, did you follow me about? No, I made me notes. Thought nothing more of it. Planned on combining you with a number of other women. Ah, part of a recipe, you mean? Correct. Who else you throw in the pot? Any I know? That's just it. I can't match any with you. I had to find out your name. Well, I found out your name. How? The butcher. No man to be trusted. He cannot complete the character sketch. She must find her, must know her dreams, her passions, her fears. You know, I began passing her home. I saw you last week on a bicycle, didn't I? I was out in the yard with the wash. Yes. You turned and looked. I must went into a ditch. <laughs> Made me feel good for an instant. Oh, well, good. Not for an instant. I didn't think anything of you, but the cut of your coat told me you were a stranger. Oh, yeah. Well, I've been living abroad. Have you been to Paris? I have. Is it true the women drive automobiles there? Some. <sighs> Lovely. Do the women drink in public and flirt as they please? Some do. Oh, isn't that grand? Then Ireland can't be far behind. <laughs> uh, your talk, why, even your laughter has our ring to it. Well, I was born from here. I've returned to publish a book. Uh, well, well wishes with your ventures. Thank you. Now, do you 
understand why I came here. I need you to hear you speak. They do have a way with words, all right. I've been told that by more than a few. Uh, Bloom, the husband, doesn't like the flow. You might find him a curious sort, being such a curious sort yourself. Oh, uh, first you, then perhaps. Uh, what's his name? Leopold. That's L-E-O. Uh, you being a writer must know how to spell. The sound of my words not educated enough for his grand ears. It's a pity. Oh. So many marry the very person who doesn't like the sound of their words. Oh. A real sorrow. What do you know of sorrow? You're a man. I'm not so easily one, Mr. Writer. Why would I want you to write of me? What need have I? To hear your song sung. Well, it's your song they'll be hearing, not mine. You'll take what you can use. You'll bend, twist, farce till they come out the rhythm of Mr. Joyce. Not the rhythm of mine. You have every right to be suspect of me. Oh. You smell like a priest. Anyone ever tell you that? No. All of you men of the creative bent, distorters. Once a fella painted me. When I accused him of missing me in his picture, he claimed he was doing an impression. <sighs> Yeah, but I'm trying to capture the very breath of you. Forget it. You priest-smelling men are all the same. You don't know the nature of joy. So you've come to me. Yes. For it's joy I know about. Not paper-thin feelings like pleasant, nice, comfortable. Angels sing about it. Such a rare thing, this joy I know about. Yes. And why should I tell of such joy to you? What's in it for me? Well, didn't I overhear your sadness that your beauty won't last? Well, let me write your story, Molly. Your wonders will last for as long as men's read. You're full of your importance as a writer, aren't you? Oh, yes. Dribble. You're offering me dribble. Huh. Dublin is filled with women who want me to write about them. But you want me. Isn't that so, Mr. Joyce? Yes, I want you. All the compliments in my life, and believe me, James, there have been plenty, have got me nowhere. Some of the same things have to be gained by me as will be gained by you. Such as? Money. That's impossible. No, it's not. Uh, you're turning this act, this act of poetry into a business venture. That is correct. Well, I don't know what to say. I wasn't expecting this. Full of surprises, aren't I? What about truth? Art, creativity? Oh, don't waste your wind. My mind won't change. I don't know if the book will sell. I mean, I'm a poor man. With me in it, it's bound to sell. How can such a pretty woman even think this way? Let me tell you, James, when pretty is your currency, you take precautions. For pretty leaves. I find this whole discussion not conducive for writing. You're not writing now. You're discussing a few minor alterations to enable you to write. You know what? I'm known as a fair man. A virtue of mine also. Fairness. Well, what do you consider fair? What part of the book do you think I'll comprise? Offhand, I'd say less than 10%. Then that's my worth, 10%. Book would be better with more of me in it, though. 10% of what? 
of everything you make on the book. I get 10%. Oh, I find that exorbitant. It's greedy, unladylike. <laughs> Too bad. Unbefitting this bargaining from you. There's no place in my book on this woman of pleasure. And how am I to purchase my pleasures? They're getting more and more expensive every day. I can't believe I was so wrong about you. What a regrettable end. Should I go out the back? Walk out the front. Give him something to talk about coming home from mass. It was a pleasure. That's what they've all said. What a sad squash of a man, but he gives grand whiskey. I was thinking, Molly, 10% seems fair. Good. I've always had a superstition someone would write my story, as well you as another. Now sit, we'll have to work fast before Bloom comes home. You're to write. No leaving to your mind to remember I want none of your impressions. As you wish. If you to start, James, I'm warning you. I promise, Molly, I'll tell it your way. What? Another whiskey? No, not while I'm writing. Oh, me. I've always liked that little extra something to drink when I wander into the territory the church warns against. <laughs> what territory be that, Molly? Where a man and a woman find pleasure in one another. Ah, oh, James, wait till I tell you about the rhododendrons and him in his tweed and how he tilted his hat. You'll love that part. But first, once upon a time, I said yes. Yes, because he never did a thing like that before, as asked to get his breakfast in bed with a couple of eggs. Wow, that was lovely. Thank you, my friends. Um, I would like to now introduce our band of actors. To begin, um, Eileen Lawless, Rob Mobley, Kim Moreska, Brian Carter, Jeremy Funk, Dustin Sullivan, and Kelly Monahan. Thank you all. Um, what a pleasure to, a pleasure. Um, all right, so I'm gonna start with some um, questions about working on this ridiculous Zoom medium. And when you're playing comedy, here's my question. Um, how do you begin to deal with each other when you can't hear people laughing, you can't hear the audience laughing, you can't really see another person's reaction. Um, so does anyone wanna take that on and talk about that a little bit? I have the experience of doing comedy and hearing no laughter. <laughs> okay, we're having some nice comments here. Um, some lovely com com um, um, people are saying very nice things I'm seeing in the chat, but I'm not seeing questions yet. So here we go. Uh, any, anyone want to just take on that or what, what it's like to work in a vacuum like this? Dustin, you look like you want to say something. <laughs> I, I mean, I found for, for me, it feels like it's best to not overthink it because otherwise I just dig myself a very quick hole of like what's happening. Does anybody understand what I'm trying to do? I mean, fortunately, we've now been so far into this that we've had uh, a lot of late night hosts to look at and see how they handle the situation. So if we can just bring our John Oliver energy, I think everything's going to be right. fun. Right. Well, I think it was beautifully played. You, you played everything so well. Other, other thoughts on this? Um, we've been well, doing it 
worked a lot this year. We've been, you know, we've done a lot of Zoom. I think everybody in the audience has done a lot of Zoom. So you've gotten kind of comfortable. But as a performer, it is really different because you're just alone with a little square. So yeah. Yeah, I think I think not overthinking it is a good idea. I think, um, I mean, just focusing on the material and your partner or your people that you're working with helps, you know, just kind of. Mm. Oh, here we go. I'm getting this thing. Eileen, your Irish accent is fabulous. How did you perfect it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, who is that? One of my sisters? Um, I, uh, I, I, I've got, I come from a long line of Irish speaking folks and I, I just, um, I love playing with that accent. It's fun. Mm. Lots of spicy it. Irish women in my history. Oh, well, it, it certainly has um, um, paid off. Yes, I'm getting lots of compliments. I'm looking for more questions. Um, all right, hey, Kelly, what's it like to work on a story, a short story that's written like 300 years ago? Uh, well, thanks to uh, having a brilliant director, it uh -huh. was uh, not that hard. <laughs> <laughs> um, we had some back and forth about this. My uh, my instinct was to uh, to sort of do it. Period. I had uh, actually thought of letting my my hair down so I would uh, look more uh, wow. 18th century. Hmm. But um, Carol talked me out of that, perhaps wisely. <laughs> and um, it was it was interesting to do it uh, to go against my instincts and to. Uh, you know, I guess it's not for me to say how it worked, but it. Um, no, I think it worked pretty well. I, I'm not fishing for compliments, please. Um, let's see. I'm gonna <laughs> even um, less fishing for criticism. <laughs> <laughs> that's the answer to that question. All right, Jeremy. Let me ask you this. Um, now we've done this, or, or any of you fellows who have done the Shakespeare and and Kim too, is it? Um, a very different experience. We did this once outside or in the, the atrium of the library. Some, um, what's the difference? Um, there, there's a lot more physicality involved when, when you're on stage. Oh God, yes, and we all remember it. And, <laughs> and laughing. <laughs> in, in particular, the uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, to slide, slide, slide into <laughs> uh, there's the rub. Um, uh, so it was, it was uh, an interesting challenge to sort of find the 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 facial or the vocal choices that could replace or supplement those moments. Mm. Sure. Well, I, I think it played incredibly well. Um, I, I think that it that it's kind of perfect for Zoom zooming. Um, and, and Brian, you have anything to add about any of that? Um, well, you know, I well definitely the live audience helps as well the the energy and the response but um you know i also enjoyed uh, watching jeremy uh do his slide as well <laughs> now rob james joyce is an awfully famous character how do you begin to play a character that's so famous to you? i just i just played it like me ah well, you and James Joyce seem to have, um, um, and for you, no, I mean. No, but seriously, um, uh, that's a good question. Um, I think that this is a piece I could definitely dig my teeth in and, and maybe working on it for uh, quite some time, I might start to get close to what it is because there's a lot going on there. Well, I think you got, you, the two of you got an awful lot. It's very beautiful. Boy, the writing in, in this play is gorgeous. Yeah, really. And I believe we have the playwright here. Oh. oh. I believe that we have Sheila Walsh here. Oh, wow. Um, I don't think, she, I mean, I think she's in the audience and we love this play. And um, yeah. I just think it's, it's beautiful. wonderful to have it. Um, um, how do we, wait, I'm reading some questions, so bear with me. How hard is it to rehearse to get your timing right when you're not in the same room with your fellow actors? Mm. Leap of faith. <laughs> I love this kick-ass librarian. I have to say, I just love her. I'm flattered. Do you think we got the timing right? I definitely think you did. How do you all feel right now? 
thoughts? Hmm. Carol? I'm seeing some Q and A's. Wait a minute, maybe we've got some questions here. Yes, I want to know where and how do you find these plays? Mm. Ah, you, read yeah. a lot of plays. You, yeah. Read a lot of plays. Um, uh, <laughs> and then... Um, Carol, I have a question here. It's Amy Allen speaking. Please. Yes. Uh, someone says, tell us your secret. Where do you put your script so it looks like you're looking into the camera? Great question. Should we tell them or should we not tell, tell them? them. <laughs> <laughs> should we give away our tricks? I don't know. This is um, thrilled that we trick them. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I wasn't sure if it was working. I'm so glad it did. <laughs> oh, it totally did. Somebody I tell. This is not a secret. Script and I minimize the zoom right. so each takes up half the page and you can kind right. of toggle between. That's how I do it. Right. Yeah, I, I position mine in a Word document centered right below yeah. the, uh, yeah. the camera. Right. And I found a way to uh, remove the the edit bar on the, in the Word document. So yeah. I got the words yeah. as close to the camera as possible. And yeah. And it, but for me, this is the first time I've performed on Zoom, and uh, this Ooh. is it took me some some going back and forth to you know make it not look like this, you know. Yeah. Well, what is very admirable about what all of you were able to do is that, of course, when you work, you're looking at the camera, you're not looking. You, you, the intent, the the goal is to really look at the camera, so you go back and forth like you're holding the script, but it's right underneath the camera, so that's what. That's the secret. It's like uh, somebody at the last one talked about the, the little green dot in the center of your screen is your acting partner. Yeah. And so you do, when you do a staged reading, you're really, you, usually you're, you know, taking it to your partner, even if you do have a script. But here you're taking it to this little friendly green dot so that you guys experience it as I'm talking to my partner. I'm talking to this person. Yeah. But you're acting with the green dot. Yeah, I mean, yeah. and goodness, you know, I mean, and Rob too, but, but, <laughs> but who is definitely not a green dot? Yes, not a green dot. Um, thank you. My spirits are lifted. Great performance. We got some lovely compliments. I'm looking for a few more good questions. How much time do you guys spend working on specific Zoom skills? Eye contact with computer. Well, there we go. Um, we probably had about three or four rehearsals on each of these plays. A little bit, depending depending on if we've done them before. Um, we try to. Um, what love the first play? I do not know the playwright of the first play's name is Watkins. Jason Watkins, and I don't remember if he's written any other plays, but we can Google him and find out. How oh, can you ask the actors about what, oh, are things starting to open up in the real world? Does anybody want to talk a bit about that? Kim, well, the, you're, yeah, yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No. no, go ahead, Brian, you can start. Well, they, you know, the Playhouse in the Park just announced they're going to go forward. Um, uh, they're they're going to do a lot of outdoor live stuff in the city, I hear. Um, TV and film has never stopped. It's been going and... I think right now, ironically, the safest place you could be is on a, a set. A lot of testing, and uh, they're very rigorous in the mask wearing. And um, uh, but yeah, but hopefully, yeah, theater is going to come because it's been it's been brutal. It's yeah, distant. yeah. And of course, all auditions now. Kim and I, we were just talking about this. Tim, do you want to talk about the audition? How the process? If they're all at home, everybody yeah, auditions. Yeah, we have to take it. ourselves from home. And it's, it's just really challenging because, you know, you don't have a scene partner. Sometimes you have to call a friend or I'm always calling my sister, seeing if she can read the other lines on the phone while I film on my iPad. And you got to get like a playing background, but you also have to have lighting. It's just, it's really challenging. And you also don't have the benefit of being in the room with casting or with the director to work with them. So you have to sort of take your best guess as to what they're looking for and hope you get it right. So it's a challenge. But, you know, you do what you got to do. Totally. 
Yeah. <laughs> right. You do save though on travel and gas and that's all what, right. headaches. But then you yeah. don't leave your house ever. Yeah, yeah that's true. <laughs> I miss the uh, being, you know, when you walk into a room if you're reading for a part and you see eight people there, you know exactly and if you see you sort of figure out who you are in other people's eyes by who else is sitting in the room. <laughs> I don't know. It's. I'm um, actually glad about that part. I'm glad I don't have to wait to go into the audition room and like I'm my competition. Yeah. Why is she in there so much longer than me? You know, I'm glad that I'm glad we don't have to do that part. But I hope my arch nemesis is okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I just got to to an answer. Jason Wilkins, who wrote Kick Ass Librarian, is also a librarian. Oh. In addition to being a playwright, composer, and musician. So um, that's the answer for that. We're getting bravo, many, many thanks. So I'm going to just tell a little about our upcoming season, which will be outside. And more than likely, you will be seeing some of these actors or all of these actors. And we're going to be in Westport and Fairfield and Greenwich. And we're going to be sharing our outdoor venues and we'll be having microphones for everyone and we will the show will go on and i think we're going to have some fun i think it'll be you know very much wonderfulness to for all of us to get together together so stay on our go on our website jibproductions.org and um put your name on our mailing list if it's not there and we'll keep you uh posted on when we're going live uh, anyone want to wrap this up? Have anybody t talk a little bit more about the language? Eileen, the language of Jane <laughs> Joyce is so stunningly beautiful. Um, I, I tell you, things really play on Zoom, I think. I think we've gotten pretty good at it. I'm going to give us all a compliment <laughs> because they, they really spoke to me, I'll tell you that. And I think we had a nice time here tonight. Um, Everything's in close-up. Everything's in close-up. You know, it's a sign of a uh, of a of a, a bad film director when you see everything in close-up. That's right. That's, that's the, right. That's the giveaway. Ah! Yep. <laughs> close-up, close-up, close-up. Yep. Yeah. Don't know where to put the camera, so just no nope. close. Yep. But um, it is what it is. All right. Somebody else wrote <laughs> instead of me. Great eating. Let me just see if there's another good question back here. Um, do you guys work on specific skills? Do you do you practice these things? Like when you have a free hour, do you like we all practice? Is this a skill that it is? Well, right? I, I you know even you know even auditioning. Not only Kim was talking about the self taping, but like there's I, this EcoCast Live, which I don't know if any of you guys have done as well, which is basically Zoom for actors. And um, so you were auditioning in, uh, on it. And uh, certainly there's been tons of, of um, live readings uh, as well. So it's, unfortunately this year has been a lot, been, it's been about Zoom. So yeah. Yeah. repetition, you, yeah. Correct. Oh, someone wrote there, spoken arts records of James Joyce. Oh, that would be interesting because there's a lot to do and we don't, you know, there's a lot to do. So, yes. All right. Uh, do you see yourself in theater pandemic? I don't know. We're, we're going to do a lot of cool things. All right. Um, anyone want to wrap this all up? I had a great time. Thank you all. Yeah. Yes, um, thank you. Uh, come to our live shows and we'll be seeing you all soon. Thanks all right. again, everyone. You want to take it back, Amy? You're back to, uh, thank you. Amy, take it away and take us home. And everybody. Thanks again, everyone. Um, and I extend an invitation to do this again live at the Darien Art Center's Weatherstone Studio in the fall when things open up. Um, we'll be talking. Thanks, Jib Productions and all the actors. Good night. <laughs>